Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Uh, so before I get started here, I just kind of was wondering, how many people here have ever heard of gRPC? One, <laughs> two. Anybody ever used it? One. What about Cassandra? Anybody ever used that or heard of it? What about other NoSQL solutions? OK. So what I hope you take away from this talk is, first off, a little bit of understanding about what gRPC is. Uh, also, a little bit of an understanding about what Cassandra is. And then how you can build a simple gRPC-based microservice, and how you might be able to persist time series data into Cassandra with using that, that gRPC-based microservice. And then the last little bit is why you might want to use gRPC and Cassandra instead of a uh, more traditional REST and relational model for persisting time series data, uh, mainly around why it's more, why it's more performant and uh, has better throughput. So first, a little bit about myself. My name's David Beckberger. I am a senior architect at Xpiro. Um, I am from the United States. I live in te Houston, Texas. I've been developing uh, all sorts of software for about 16 years now. Everything from embedded C systems through high performance web applications to highly distributed systems. Uh, I am also a certified architect on uh, Apache Cassandra and a Datastack certified architect. Uh, I work for a company called Xpiro. What we do at Xperio is we solve problems in complex domains, specifically around big data, IoT, and high-performance computing. Uh, we do that across a variety of industries, such as financial services, oil and gas, manufacturing, anything like that. We basically, uh, my company is broken up into three separate practices. We have an architecture and development practice, where we actually build the stuff. We have a user experience practice, which uh, does an excellent job of, of figuring out workflows and how to show all this complex data in a simple way. And we have a product strategy practice where they actually figure out prioritization and how to uh, actually get this out to the customer base quickest. Uh, here are some of the clients that we have, uh, the companies that we have worked for. So, first, first thing I want to talk about is what is gRPC. Well. GRPC is a general purpose RPC framework. It was built uh, by Google. So I've, I don't know if you guys know this, but Google is highly based on a microservice style architecture. So they have a microservice style architecture. For many years, it ran on their own internally built uh, system called Stubby. Uh, Stubby was very closely tied to their internal architecture, uh, to their internal infrastructure, I should say. And uh, as they moved into uh, more of an open standard, IoT mobile application, it was no longer sufficient because it was so closely tied to their uh, internal infrastructure. Well, to solve that, they decided they wanted to move more towards a standards-based protocol. So they, that standards-based protocol became what is now gRPC. Uh, gRPC is based on the HTTP2 HTTP protocol for its transport protocol, so it's available uh, across any, any common network infrastructure, which includes many mobile devices. Uh, it's free and open source, and it's built dis uh, specifically for the problems of distributed systems. So if you've ever worked in highly distributed systems, you've probably run into the, uh, the posting on the internet of the, the fallacies of the uh, of distributed systems. Some of those fallacies are, you know, networks are always available. There's zero latency, bandwidth is infinite, <laughs> all these sort of problems where if you, go, you, know, you actually start to build a distributed system, you quickly run into them. Well, gRPC is built to handle some of those sort of uh, architectural challenges. Well, a little bit about gRPC's architecture. gRPC's architecture, it's, it's, an, uh, it's a remote procedure call architecture, and it's built to allow clients to call methods on servers as if they were local. So this is very similar to if any of you, I'm sure probably at least some of you are familiar with SOAP services and have used them before in your applications, where you are able to actually generate a client from a WSDL, and you will get a client, a client on your side that you can call without having to set up, you know, the network network uh, traffic. You don't have to set up the, re you don't have to make the request. You don't have to what happens if the request actually fails, you know, ha handling packet loss, things like that. Well, gRPC is built on the same basic idea, where you can where you're able to call the method as if it was a local client, so it simplifies the code that you have to write. It's built for writing low latency, highly scalable microservices, and it's built to be payload agnostic. By payload agnostic, uh, what I mean is, by default, uh, the default message format for uh, transferring data to and from gRPC is protocol buffers. 
Uh, protocol buffers is another standard that Google has for uh, highly highly performant message. Uh, it's a highly performant message format for passing back and forth because it's high, partially because it's highly compressible. Well. That's the standard that comes with gRPC, but it's also built in such a way that if you have, say, a service that needs a binary compression algorithm or it had, you want to transfer XML or JSON or Thrift or Atom or any one of the many other different message formats out there, you can just basically replace the protocol buffers portion with the portion for XML or JSON and you can go. gRPC is also built with bidirectional streaming. And by bidirectional streaming, I mean, that means you can stream data from the client to the server and from the server back to the client, which coming, you know, my, my background is uh, actually quite a lot of my time has been spent building REST style APIs, which when all of a sudden you realize you can stream data back and forth, it actually allows you to think, to, allows for some interesting differences between how you would build a REST API and you, how you can go out and build a, a gRPC style API. And gRPC is pluggable and extensible. Maybe you need a different authentication method, you want a different me method, for uh, method for compression, something like that. Well, it's built in such a way that you can just plug in those different methods uh, to replace what's currently, uh, what the current defaults are and go from there. Well, the first thing when it comes to gRPC is the simple model and service definition. So what you're looking at here is actually a simple model and service definition for a service called hello service. Well, that, the first two things you'll see there are the two things that are named message, hello request, and hello response. Well, what that is, what you're looking at is this is actually protocol buffers that you use to define your models and your services. So in protocol buffers, a message is essentially an ob is, is will be translated into an object. So you have an object called hello request and an object called hello response. Each of those has a single property, and one of the unique things you'll notice about protocol buffers, if you've never actually used it before, is that each property has to have a number associated with it. This is because uh, part of the way it does data compression is when it sends it over the wire, instead of sending greeting as part of the, the message packet, it actually just sends the value one. Since both sides need to know what the uh, format of the, uh, the object are is, it's, both sides are able to basically translate that back and forth. So that's why that uh, works that way. Um, if you look, uh, so after your two messages, you'll see there's a simple definition of a service. It says, in this case, it's called hello service. And it basically takes, it sends out a request, a hello request, and it gets back a hello response. So pretty straightforward. Secondly, gRPC is optimized for speed and performance. Uh, gRPC has several things built into it uh, natively that, act, that help optimize speed, performance, and actually it op help optimize bandwidth. It has things like me uh, natural message compression, uh, flow control for the message pass, as well as multiplexing of connections. So by multiplexing of connections, if you say are working in a REST style architecture, if you need to make multiple requests, you end up opening a, you know, you end up opening a request, making a request, closing it, opening, making a, you know, requesting, closing, things like that. With gRPC, you can actually have a long running persistent connection which you'll send multiple requests to, and possibly to different endpoints across that single connection. So it helps optimize the speed because you're not making multiple uh, connection and disconnect and deconnection requests, and it optimizes the performance because you're there. It also optimizes bandwidth, which is especially important if you're looking at doing a mobile application. And uh, the last, last major uh, feature that I really enjoy of gRPC is the code generation aspect of it. So by code generation, you, you've seen uh, earlier how we defined the, sim the, uh, me the uh, models and the service. Well, the uh, uh, gRPC comes with a tool called ProtoC. Well, that tool, what it does is it allows you to generate client, uh, clients, uh, client stubs and server interfaces for a variety of language. I believe currently there's eight supported languages, um, but being it's open source, you can work with any of those other languages. Um, this is sort of similar to how SOAP and WSDLs used to work, with except, except for the fact that you don't run into the uh, problems you used to have with WSDLs in SOAP services where Java wouldn't, re wouldn't render the objects quite the way that .NET was expecting it, that wasn't quite the way C++, C++ was expecting this stuff to work. Well, since it's all done through the same executable, it, it's all done in a way that's compatible. This means if you have a business service team that's writing services in Java and a web, service a web development team that wants Node.js services and maybe you're writing the server in C-sharp and you have an Objective-C 
uh, team that's writing a mobile app for a Windows phone, or uh, sorry, an iPhone. They were all able to actually have the code generated, and you know that things will work together. So next, I want to talk a little bit about what is Cassandra. Well, Cassandra is a distributed NoSQL data store built for uh, large volumes of data and, and fast read-write performance. It is an open source Apache project. It's built uh, with a no single point of failure architecture. And it's scalable. Uh, and by scalable, I mean it's built to be horizontally scalable on commodity hardware. So if, you go, if you're going to scale something like a relational database, usually the way you scale it is vertically. You get bigger servers with more processors, more memory, more disk space. With Cassandra, uh, being, as, uh, being as it's built to be horizontally scalable, that it, what it means if you need to get a bigger cluster, you end up just adding more servers to your cluster, and those, cl those servers tend to be cheaper because they're more commodity hardware. So a lot of people uh, may be familiar with the CAP theorem. Uh, well, what the CAP theorem states is there are three basic properties of, of data stores, consistency, availability, and partition tolerance, and that you can choose two of them. <laughs> well, what consistency means is that all nodes will see the same data at the same time. Availability means that every request to the store will receive a response. And partition tolerance means that the system will continue, can continue to work even during network failures. Well, if you look at something like Oracle or SQL Server, they're, they're both consistent and available. All the, the, all the data is the same across any, any of the parts of it, and it's always, it always, every request receives a response. In the case of something like Redis or a MongoDB, you basically, all the data will be the same, and it's resilient to network failures. That, you know, that's at the, uh, uh, the cost of not always being able to answer every request. Well, Cassandra, it falls under uh, what's known as an AP, or an available and partition tolerant data store. So it, what that means is every request will receive a response. It, it's very, it responds very well to network failures, you, but what you lose is the ability for some of the nodes. Sometimes the nodes will not all see the same data. So Cassandra is what's called an AP data store, and it has what's called eventual consistency. We'll talk a little bit about what eventual consistency means here in a moment. So uh, another, another comparison that's often made between relational and the NoSQL world is the concept of an ACID transaction. So if, you, if you're familiar with what ACID-compliant databases are, basically an ACID-compliant database ha has four guarantees. It guarantees that every transaction is atomic, meaning that they're all or nothing, and that they're consistent, that, once data is, uh, that as soon as a transaction compl is completed, all data is the same, that transactions are isolated in as much as a transa one transaction will not interfere with another transaction, and durable, that once the transaction is done, the results are permanent. Well, part of, one of the problems with getting those four guarantees is it actually tes tends to have a drag on the performance of your data store, because it's, some of those guarantees actually require quite a bit to actually achieve. Well, Cassandra is not an ACID-compliant data store. In the NoSQL world, uh, what you end up giving up sometimes is for some of those things in order to gain performance is uh, you, know, you end up giving up a couple of those guarantees, and they've come up with this other corollary or comparison uh, called a base compliant database. What that means is it has a base availability where the data store is always working. It has a soft state, which means that stores are not write consistent, so data may differ between, between uh, nodes or replicas of the database or data store, and that it's eventually consistent. This means that stores become consistent over time. So uh, now I want to talk a little bit about what the Cassandra architecture is. So the Cassandra is architected as a cluster. It's a group of servers. It, there's, you don't really ever run just a single Cassandra server. You actually run them as a large uh, chunk of servers. And uh, as part of that server, uh, there's a hierarchy inside the cluster as to how things are built and scaled out in order to provide that no single point of failure style architecture. So the smallest. The, the smallest part is a node. Well, a node is a server. Um, you know, a node is a server. On, next step up is a rack. A rack is very similar to like a physical rack in a data center. It can be a physical rack or a logical rack, but basically it's, it's a set of servers that will fail uh, together if they fail usually, if the rack fails. Uh, usually in case of like, if you want to think about it as an actual data center, you know they have the same power strip, they have the same network. 
Well, racks then are grouped together into what's called a data center. A data center is made up, as I said, is made up of multiple racks, which is made up of multiple nodes. A data center is very much the same as a physical data center. It can be, yet again, be physical or logical. And in Cassandra, you actually have the, the ability to actually have multiple data centers. So you may have one data center that's located here in Norway and another data center that's located in the United States. One of the unique features of Cassandra is the fact that data will be automatically replicated between the two. So you, may, so you can actually write data here in, the, in Europe and, and read it out of uh, the Americas. This means that if you have an international style uh, problem that you're trying to solve, you're able to actually optimize your applications to write to the to read or write from the uh, data center that's closest to them without having your application actually be aware. So the next thing I wanted to talk a bit about was the, the hashing architecture of Cassandra. So as I mentioned, Cassandra is, uh, is built out as a cluster. Well, in that cluster, each node, uh, th there's this concept of what's known as a token ring. A token ring uh, is a set of unique tokens uh, between two to the six, I think they run from two to the 63rd to two to the negative 63rd. I don't remember the number of unique values that exists, but that is a number that I've never seen before. <laughs> um, so for simplicity's sake here, I've just, uh, I've just uh, shown it as zero to 100. <laughs> well, the way that Cassandra works and stores data is each node owns a portion of this token ring. So in this case, we have four nodes. You know, node zero owns one to 25, node 25 owns 25 to 50, node 50 owns 50 to 75, and node 75 owns 75 to 100. Well, each node owns a, a certain set of that token ring, and um, there's a piece of code inside Cassandra called the partitioner. Well, the partitioner basically generates, uh, uses a consistent hashing algorithm to generate a token from a piece of the data that you are reading or writing called the partition key. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes about what that actually is, but just know it's a piece of the data you're reading and writing from the, from the data store. Well, it, it takes that partition key, it applies a hashing algorithm, and then it basically from that it gets back a token, and that token is what determines which node owns that data. Um, and one of the key features, as I mentioned, was the no single point of failure aspect of Cassandra. And because of that, everything is a peer. There's no master, there's no slave. So everything knows everything about all the nodes. <laughs> so all the nodes know which token ranges belong to which nodes. So here's a little example of how tokens uh, actually were going to work. So you have a client, he's making a call into node 75. Uh, you'll often see node, uh, the node that's being written, re read or written to being called the coordinator node. So the first thing that the coordinator node does is it takes the primary key out of the data that's being read. Well, it find, in this case, the, the primary key, key is Xpiro. It sends that, pri or, sorry, not the primary key, the partition key. It sends the partition key to the partitioner, which applies that consistent hashing algorithm. That consistent hashing algorithm will always send back the same data for the same partition key. In this case, the token uh, that is returned is 12. So now that, that we know that this write is going to whatever node owns the partition key range that includes 12. Well, that partition key is owned by node zero, so that is how the data is uh, determined where the data is written to. So that after the data has been written, one of the other key architectural features of Cassandra is that data is replicated. Uh, there's an, uh, num you can specify the number of times data is replicated within a data center, and that is called the replication factor, or what you'll see as RF. Uh, one important thing to note here is all of this is done without the application having to have any concept of how it actually works. So the number of replicas, and you know, uh, is basically specifies the number of times the data is copied within a data center. If you have multiple data center setups, you can actually specify different copying, different number of times it's copied between data centers. So here in Norway, you may say it's copied three times inside a data center. In the United States, it may be copied twice. Uh, that's uh, uh, one of the other key features is the ability to actually tune that based on your needs. Uh, and the last thing here is, Yet again, as part of the single point of failure, if now I'm re replicating this data multiple times, what happens if one of my nodes is down for some reason? Well, there's this functionality inside Cassandra called a hinted handoff. What it means is the coordinator node 
that the node that you're basically writing or reading your data to will basically know, okay, I need to write to node one. Well, node one's down. It will store that data locally until such time as node one comes back online, and it'll then automatically sync that data back to it. So here's a little example of how data replication will actually work in real life. So in this case, we have a four node cluster. We have a replication factor of three. That means the data is going to be written to three of these four nodes. Well, first thing that happens is a write comes in to the coordinator node. In this case, the write is A. As we talked about, next step is the partition key is pulled out of the write, it's sent to the partitioner. The partitioner then sends back the token. In this case, 12. Well, Node, uh, the coordinator node nodes that part knows that the token num with the number of 12 is owned by node 1, and it's written to node 1. At the same time, we know we need to replicate this data two more times. So while it's being written to node 1, it's actually written at the same time to nodes 2 and nodes 3. The way, it, uh, the, way the cluster determines what nodes it needs to write to is if you have a replication factor of 3 and it's owned by node 1, it just writes to the next two nodes in this cluster, so nodes 2 or node 3. If it was owned by node 2, it would write it to node 3 and node 4 as the replica data. So what does it mean to be eventually consistent? It means that data will eventually match on all the replicas. This isn't in terms of seconds or hours or days. It's actually in terms of milliseconds in almost every case. Um, one of the other key parts of uh, eventual consistency is what's known as the consistency level, or uh, what you often see uh, written down as CL. There are 11 different levels you can choose for writes and 10 different levels you can choose for reads. But what consistency level means is it's the number of replicas that have to respond back that they've either read or written the data correctly in order for your request to succeed. So even though it's being written to three different replicas, maybe you have your consistency level set to one, which just means any one of those has to respond back to me that it's written the data successfully for, the, my, for my, my application, my client application, to get back a successful uh, ACK. Um, well, because, you, because of this ability to be able to, 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 be able to change how many, uh, you know, how many replicas need to respond, you can actually tune the consistency level to affect the performance and availability of your, uh, your application. Because, you know, let's take the example I just talked about where we had a, you know, a consistency level of one. Well, if you have a consistency level of one, that means the fastest one to be able to write the data is going to be able to respond back to me first. If I have a consistency level, there's another consistency level called quorum, which is very commonly used. And basically, it Stands, it means a majority. It means a majority of your replicas have to respond successfully in order for that to happen. That means, so in the case of a replication factor of three, that means two of them. If you had a replication factor of five, it would be three, seven would be four, and so on. But that mean, but the more, time, the more nodes that you end up requiring to have written the data in order for your request to succeed, the slower the performance of your application is going to be. Well, the other part of this is the availability. There is a consistency level that's known as all, which means all of the replicas have to respond back. So it's very similar to uh, uh, a, actually in that case, it's more like an acid transaction where everything has been written and all the data will be consistent. The problem with that is if any of those nodes are down, now every request is going to fail. So if you, do, if you choose that, it's, it's very rarely actually used in real life <laughs> because of that downside. Um, but if you choose that, know that any of your like any of your requests will fail if one of your nodes is down. Um, and lastly, the you know consistency level it can actually be tuned for read and write performance on a per query basis. So different queries can be tuned to have different consistency levels. Maybe you have one that you need all on because you really want to make sure that it, if it's written, it's written to everywhere. In that case, you can actually use the, you know you can use all. And maybe you have another one where you don't. Have his, uh, you don't need as high a guarantee, so you use consistency level of one. Uh, the, the ones you most commonly see used are one and quorum. Well, one quorum, and there's actually a, uh, another concept in there called local one and local quorum. And what that means is if you have multiple data centers, it's only waiting for the data in the local data center you're writing to. It's not going to wait for anything to go across, you know, in the case of having one in Europe and one in America. You're not going to wait for anything to go across the ocean in order to do that. Uh, and this is all uh, tuned by, basically, the, uh, in Cassandra, there's uh, something called CQL, which stands for Cassandra Query Language, which is actually, uh, we'll see it here in a little bit, but it's very SQL-like. 
So why might you want to use like Cassandra over a relational database? Well, the number one reason probably is performance. Cassandra is, is optimized for high, uh, very fast read and write performance. And when I talk about very fast read and write performance, we're talking single digit millisecond read and write uh, efforts. It's pretty much something you're never going to be able to actually achieve out of a relational model. It's also linearly scalable. And what, is I, what do I mean by when I say linearly scalable? I mean if you have twice as many nodes in your cluster, so if you, have, if you add twice as many nodes to your cluster, you will be able to process twice as many transactions. That's not really true in any relational database. If you add twice as big a server, you're still not going to get twice the performance out of that database. It's also natively built as a distributed data store. Uh, by the, and, and what I mean by that is the fact that it is, it's built to handle data that's too big to fit on a single server. So if you have a relational database and you need to scale it up to data that's too big for a single server, what do you end up doing? You end up having to build clusters. You end up having to shard it. You end up having to do uh, rel relatively complex exercises, if anybody's had to go in about this, and that has a lot of overhead involved in actually getting it to work. Well, since Cassandra is natively built as a distributed technology, it can handle pretty much any size scale of data. You know, terabytes, tens of terabytes, hundreds of terabytes, it doesn't matter. And because of the distributed nature in which it's built, it's actually built for an always-on style architecture. So you can actually have a cluster that is never not available. So if you start doing a lot of research on Apache Cassandra, what you'll find is you'll find this concept of, you'll see a lot of references to data stacks. And I just wanted to throw a little bit in there to say, tell you what the difference is so uh, you don't get confused like I did when I first started. Well, so as I mentioned, Apache Cassandra is an open source free project. Well, data stacks is, is data stacks provides a commercial version of that project with additional features added. Uh, some of those additional features are it has a full text, it has integration with a full text indexer uh, based on Apache Solar. It also has uh, integration with a uh, analytics tool based on Apache Spark. Uh, so those two things are tightly integrated. That's available in DataStax has two editions. There's community edition, which is free, and there is an enterprise edition. The enterprise edition also adds some additional features around enterprise level security, integration with the Active Directory, uh, has some additional tools around uh, automating some of the management tasks you end up having to do with a Cassandra cluster. And uh, uh, there's a tool, it also comes with it called Op Center, which is a very nice way to monitor the, uh, the health and, per and uh, performance functionality of your cluster. Uh, and probably the last and most, the biggest reason I, uh, I see a lot of people do it is it comes with a support ticket. If, you know, being an open source product, if it breaks on you, you end up having to go to news groups, you end up having to, you know, post things on Stack Overflow to get help. Well, if you have the enterprise version, you actually have someone you can call. So, next I wanted to talk a little bit about a pro, you know, here's a problem where you may want to start thinking, you, you may want to actually uh, use, you know, gRPC and uh, Cassandra instead of uh, REST and relational database sort of model. So you, write, you work for a company that has, does a SaaS product for truck, that monitors truck engine sensors, basically. You know, you currently have like a thousand, truck, a thousand trucks in your fleet and you take readings every 10 seconds. This is built on a web API, uh, you know, REST set of services on top of a SQL Server database. I'm guessing we've all built something probably <laughs> very similar to this before. <laughs> well, you recently just landed a huge new client. They love the UI, they love how the, the product works, they just want some changes to how the data is actually read out of you, uh, how the data is uh, captured. Instead of reading it once every 10 seconds, they now want to read it once every second. They also want to add lat latitude and longitude information from their truck's GPSs so they can see not only where it failed, or not only when it failed, but where it was at at the time. They're, adding, they're going to add 10,000 trucks to, the f to your system, and part of the contract was you needed to minimize their costs and provide them a zero downtime environment. Well, what, what's the problem? Well, now you've gone from a, a, lo a transaction load of about 100 measurements a second to 22,000 measurements a second. It's a relatively large increase. <laughs> uh, and, you know, your data load has gone from about 35 megabytes a day to 2.2 gigabytes. Well, your architecture is going to need to change in some way to handle this additional increase in scale. I think we can all agree. <laughs> so here's the solution I'm proposing. Um, which just uh, in case you are interested, all the code is available on GitHub if you want to take a look at what we did here. 
Well, the solution I'm proposing is, first off, we're going to change out the SQL Server database for a Cassandra cluster. This will provide some of the scalability of not only the transactional load that's going to be required, but also the data load that's going to be required. Because at 2.2 gigabytes a day, how quickly is that going to take to fill up a single server? Won't take that long. <laughs> And we're going to replace our REST-based REST set of services with a gRPC-based set of services. So the first step here is to define the model and service. We've seen this a little bit already uh, with uh, earlier on, where this is basically using protocol buffers to define out the models and service end services and service endpoints that you're going to have. So in this case, you have a service endpoint called trucking. It's got two different, uh, you have a service called trucking. It has two different endpoints. One of them is called uh, record location, and the other one is called read last location. What the, um, so if you look at read last location, what it's going to do is it's going to take in a trip object, and it's going to return back a point object. So it will read the last location that's been stored in the system. And then you have one called record location. And this is where it kind of gets a little bit interesting from an API standpoint. This is one that actually will take a stream of points and return back a stream of responses. So this is, one of the, this is an example of how you can set up that bi-directional streaming uh, functionality that I talked about with, that gRPC had. So you're able to set that up uh, that way. Uh, you'll notice then there's a few objects of a point uh, one of the things to notice about the point is the first property is actually another object. So with, with protocol buffers, you are able to build out complex domain objects and transmit them back and forth across the wire. So now that we've defined our server, our client and server stubs, sorry, the text is actually pretty wonky here. Uh, <laughs> what you'll see at the top there, if you could read it, is that um, Basically, this is the code that you'll need to, the command line tool code that you'll need to run to actually generate out the client and server stubs. Uh, what you can see is basically it's a call to that proto C file, and then it's a bunch of command line arguments to specify where the file you want to write, uh, where the, the proto file is that you want to actually compile, and where you want the outputs to go, and what you want those outputs to be. Unfortunately, I know most of us all here are Windows guys and don't really like command line stuff. But at this point, there is no uh, GUI tool toolkit to do this. But like I said, it's still a relatively new technology, so I expect that will probably come along at some point here in the future. So you run that command, that big long command, and what do you get out of it? You end up getting out two separate uh, CS files. One of those files will be called truckingservice.cs, and that will contain all your model definitions. The other one is called Trucking Service gRPC, and that will contain the, the gRPC client and the client stub and the server interface that you will need to actually implement for your service. So now that we've created the service, uh, now that we've defined the service and we've created the stubs, the next step is to go and actually create the key space in the table. So in Cassandra, you have what's called a key space. A key space is basically the same as a database is in SQL Server. It's a collection of tables. Um, what you can see here is that the, uh, sorry, what you see here is actually, this is all CQL that you're seeing uh, on screen here. As you'll notice, it's very similar to the way SQL looks, and it's actually very similar to the way SQL functions. So the first thing you'll see here is that we're going to create a key space called NDC Oslo. Uh, which is, which with that we'll just do is create a new key space called NDC Oslo. And then we're going to set the replication on it. Uh, this is where you are able to set the replication factor of your uh, system. We talked about the replication factor earlier is the number of nodes that data is copied to. Well, there's a couple of properties you can set, the first being the class. There's, there's two separate classes you can set. If you're working on a single data center, you'd use what's called simple strategy. Uh, and then you can set the replication factor. In this case, I have it set to one because I was running this on a single node cluster, <laughs> which is not much of a cluster. <laughs> but uh, the other one is uh, if you're working in a multi data center environment, you'll get uh, there's one called network topology strategy. The interesting thing about network topology strategy is that you're able to set the replication factor on a per data center basis. So you can set up multiple data centers. They can be of different sizes, and you'll still actually be able to set different replication factors on them. 
So once you run that command, it'll basically create your key space. The next thing we're going to do is run a use command, which will just put you in the context of NDC Oslo. This is exactly the same as doing a use command in SQL. So now that we're in the context of the key space we've created, we're going to create a new table. This should look very familiar pretty much to anybody that's done a lot of SQL. I'm just going to create a table called location by trip ID. I'm going to set a few properties. You know, there's a truck name, a manufacturer, a trip ID, a time, a latitude, and a longitude. Uh, I guess w one key thing to note is if you're actually using Cassandra, the timestamp is all in Unix time epic, which can be kind of interesting to get to from a .NET world if you have never had that fun. So the last part you'll see there is actually the primary key. So the primary key is uh, not the same as a primary key in a relational database. In a relational database, the primary key is used as an index, and it's used to actually provide uh, relational uh, and data integrity across tables. In Cassandra, what it's actually used for is it's made up of two separate parts. The two parts are the partition key and the clustering keys. Uh, what you'll see in this example is we have truck name, manufacturer, and trip ID, and those are what are, are inside a set of parentheses, and that's what makes the partition key. Uh, if you remember from earlier, the partition key is the piece of data that is taken and given to the partitioner in order to make the token, and the token is determines which node owns that data. So that's what the partition key does. The key, uh, the key after that is the clustering keys. Right now I only have one clustering key of time. You can have many clustering keys. And then you can specify the order in which you actually want them to be written out, ascending or descending order. Well, the point of the clustering keys is, so once you know that the data is going to be written to node one, for example, what, what actually happens on the, on the actual Cassandra node when the data is written, it's written, each partition is written to a separate file. Well. Once it's written to a separate file, the clustering keys tell you what order to write the data into the file in. In this case, the data will physically be written into the file in time descending order. So now that we've created our database, or created our key space, we've created our table, we've created our stubs, and we've created our, uh, our objects, the next step is to actually attach to the, the cluster and start doing some work. Well, uh, there's an open source uh, C Sharp driver that's provided by Datastax at the uh, address you'll see there. And basically, if you want to connect to the cluster, you basically build it out as you see here. You know, you basically do a cluster.builder, and then you add contact points. Well, in, the, in this case, I'm showing you want to add, I'm showing adding multiple contact points. Well, why would you want to add multiple contact points? Well, the reason you want to add multiple contact points is, one, it provides the ability for no single point of failure. Because say, in this case, node 2 is down. If that was the only contact point there listed there, your application would not be able to actually read or write data from the thing. The second point is you want to be able to spread the load of those, reads, those read requests and those write requests across the different nodes in your cluster. Since every node in the cluster is a peer, there is no master, any node can handle a read and write request. So if you put all the nodes in your driver, what will actually happen behind the scenes is the driver will automatically round robin across the different nodes to spread the load out. That way, not one load is not uh, that way. One node is not taking the majority of the read and write requests, so it helps prevent uh, overloading a single node in your cluster and slowing down the performance of the cluster as a whole. So, now that we've able, now we've connected to the cluster the first thing we want to do is write some data to it. Well, if you're familiar with SQL, as I'm guessing probably everybody here is, this should look very familiar to you. You're just going to insert data into the table name, then you're going to specify the columns that you want to insert, and then you're going to specify the values that you want to insert into that column. I mean, you could take this and pull it right into a SQL database and it would work just fine. One interesting fact to note about Cassandra is when you're doing inserts or updates in Cassandra, it does what's called an upsert. It's actually, this is actually a not uncommon thing in many NoSQL databases. And what an upsert is, is if you're familiar with a SQL merge statement, it's the same functionality. What it means is if the data exists, it will update that data. If the data does not exist, it will insert that data. So now that we've successfully written data to the data stores, let's read some data back from it. 
Well, how do I go about reading data back from it? Well, you again write a CQL command, which is very similar to the SQL command. You know, I'm going to select star from my table name, where some filtering criteria, in this case the truck name, the manufacturer, and the trip ID. And in, uh, then there's this idea in, of called limit one. Uh, what I'm doing here is I'm actually limiting it to only the top result. So I will actually only get back the last read, the last location ever written by time. That's where the clustering keys come in. It's very similar to the concept of a top one in SQL. So a couple interesting things to note here is there are some constraints around how you can actually filter data in CQL. In CQL, you can do a select star from a table, in which case it will go out, it will scan every cluster in the table, or every, cl every node in the cluster for that table information and try to correlate it together. If you try to do that on, any, uh, on a cluster of any size, it will probably time out. Uh, it doesn't usually take too long before you get to the level of it just times out before it actually is able to process all that data. So if you want to add a filtering criteria to it, there, there are some constraints. Some of those constraints uh, are, the first one is, if you're going to add a filtering criteria, you have to add, at minimum, every key in the partition key as an equality clause. This means because my partition key consisted of truck name, manufacturer, and trip ID, I have to have truck name, manufacturer, and trip ID as equality clauses in my uh, filtering, in my where clause, in my filtering clause. That's because, as we said, those are the three items that are used to determine, uh, used by the partitioner to determine the token. So what, the way that works, the way it works is it takes us, when you do a select query, it takes those three keys, it finds out what the token is, and then it's able to very quickly go straight to the node that owns that data, to the file that owns that data, and pull that data back out. That's one of the ways in which the performance of Cassandra is enhanced by adding that constraint on. The second constraint is if you want to actually filter, or if you want to filter on anything beyond the partition key, those must be one of the clustering keys. So you have to have, uh, so basically in this case, the only additional item uh, column that I could actually search on is time, because it was the only clustering key I added into it. Cluster, uh, if you're searching on that, those can be inequality searches uh, if they're clustering keys, but they have to be equality keys, uh, equality searches if they are partition keys. So uh, next I want to actually show you a little bit of running code. So what you'll see here, uh, this is actually the client side of the application. What, what we were showing before was everything that's written on the server side. So this is the client side. So in order to create a client, basically the first thing I have to do is I have to set up a channel. All a channel is, it specifies essentially where is the endpoint I'm going to be talking to. Since this is over, you know, since it's over HTTP key, in this case, I'm actually going to run it against localhost uh, on port 50,051. Uh, first thing I do is come in here and I start, I basically start a new uh, asynchronous task called start truck recording. Well, let's go look at start truck recording. Well, start truck recording, first thing it does is it creates a new trucking client. Uh, that is the client stub that was generated by the, uh, generated from the definition. So between these two things, I have now been able to connect, those two lines of code will basically now connect your client to your server. Much simpler than a REST style architecture. Well, first thing, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to basically set up a call to record, lo uh, to record location. Record location, if we remember, was that bi-directional streaming endpoint. So we can actually, s this, this is an example of how you actually will write a bi-directional streaming to be able to stream data back and forth. You know, the theory in this case is a truck, you know, when a truck starts up, it connects once and then it's able to stream data back and forth to get, and what it's actually doing, it'll stream, it'll stream uh, latitude and longitude data and it will send back the actual time it took to write the data out. Uh, that becomes important because the first step here is we're going to set up an asynchronous task to basically wait for those response messages to come in. So those response messages come in. Uh, the way I have this written is it'll write every fifth, it'll basically, has an, it writes every fifth response message that comes in, it will take the average of that data, it will then call a 
read last location so you can see how long, so it will actually write uh, it would actually read data out of the data source and then it will print all that information with those times out so uh, after you set up the task to read the responses back what the next step is to actually basically just start sending data in so uh, this code all it does is create a new point with some some made up data and write that asynchronously once a second to the server. So what you'll see here is it's now these the servers are connecting together. Uh, that, that first one is because the server had not started up by the time it tried to connect. So you'll see it's writing out data and it's taking about 178 or 170 or so milliseconds to read and write data to and from the cluster. Well, that doesn't seem super uh, performant to me. I don't know about you guys, but 170 milliseconds is pretty slow. However, that's because the cluster this is currently writing to is located in Oregon in the United States. It's about 7,700 kilometers away and has about a round trip ping time of about 164 milliseconds. So if you th figure 164 milliseconds out of, a, you, you subtract that from the 170 milliseconds we were seeing, it means it was taking about five, sec five milliseconds to write that data out, which seems a lot better to me. Um, if you can see on the left or on the right there, I uh, actually ran this locally in a data center in Oregon to get more realistic numbers. And the numbers there were anywhere from about one to five milliseconds to actually write. I think that's probably a little bit misleading. I think at that point you're down into the, uh, the accuracy of the .NET stopwatch class because I don't think it was actually reading and writing within a millisecond. It seems a little too fast <laughs> from, from, my, uh, from, from my experience. But I have seen uh, many times in in my experience, I have seen where that data will be read and written in about somewhere between three to 10 milliseconds. So now I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the trade-offs between gRPC uh, when using gRPC and Cassandra. So some of the trade-offs when using gRPC. First off, and probably the biggest trade-off, at least from my perspective when using gRPC, is that it's not for browsers at this point. Unfortunately, there is, uh, it relies heavily on HTTP2, HTTP trailers functionality. And so far, none of modern browsers have had a robust enough implementation of it in order for them to be able to build a client against it. Uh, there is hope that this will be coming in the future. I, I hope, really hope to see this in the future because uh, it, would, uh, it would make it so much more useful. The uh, other part is if you have large messages that you're passing back and forth, anything larger than about a megabyte, you end up uh, having to chunk that data. Theore the theoretically, uh, theoretically, you can write gRPC messages are up to about, I think it's 63 megabytes, but the practical limit in what they suggest you use is no longer than one megabyte. This means if you have a you know, five megabyte file, you have to chunk that data up, you have to send it back and forth. And unfortunately, there's no built-in functionality currently in gRPC to handle the chunking, so you end up having to write it yourself. Also, uh, in, dot, in protocol buffers version three, which is what all of this runs, uh, which is what all gRPC runs on, there's no support for nullable data types. Uh, I find this relatively annoying because if you get, end up get, having a value that's an integer and it comes across as a zero, does that mean it's a zero or does that mean it's a null? You end up having to <laughs> do some work. That has to be a limitation in the C sharp generator because every, every property in uh, version 3 of protocol buffer are optional. It's, op it's optional, but when, you, when it's generated, yes. It, it's, okay, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, and probably one of the other things, especially if you want to use this in production, is there, it's still a beta release. <laughs> so it's, it's a beta release, so a lot of places, uh, especially a lot of enterprises, won't allow you to use it in production yet. It's a strong beta. I think it's on beta 14 at this point. Uh, so it's been around for a while. So what are some of the trade-offs when using Cassandra? 
Well, probably the biggest trade-off when using Cassandra and the biggest limitation that you'll actually run into is the fact that you are not allowed to join between tables in Cassandra. So uh, what that means is, it means exactly what I said as far as every, if you want to get data out of a table in Cassandra, all that data must live in one table. This leads to a lot of denormalization and data duplication. Um, Basically, when you do data modeling in Cassandra, it is far more important uh, than it ever was in like a relational model because you have to build your, your basically your Cassandra key space is built on what's called a table per query methodology. So if you're going to build out your key space, the first thing you have to do is figure out how you're going to get the data out of your application because if you don't know how the you get the data out of your application, you're not going to be able to actually build out your tables in a way that you can be able to fetch that data. Because the second limit, one of the second limitations, as I already alluded to, is that you can't really do ad hoc queries. If you want to do queries that have filtering, all those filtering criteria have to live, have to be part of the primary key. That's pro not necessarily completely true. There are several other methodologies. There is there's this concept of secondary indexes and materialized views. And if actually if you're using uh, the data stacks, you can use the full text indexer. As, and query against it. However, each of those has an effect on the performance and in, generally, and in general, they're discouraged from being used unless there's no other way to do it. Uh, Cassandra also has minimal support for aggregations. Uh, it has support for, uh, for some, min, max, and average, but those are the only uh, aggregators it supports. And in general, because of the performance hit that it, t it requires to actually make those work, they're not recommended to be used. As you probably now have guessed, the complexity of Cassandra is far more than that of a n normal relational database. Um, part of that's being just based the nature of being a distributed data store. Um, part of that is just the complexity with which is required to get the performance that, th that people are looking for. Um, you know, Cassandra is not something you're going to sit down in a weekend or an evening and figure out how to use correctly. It's going to take some time in order to be able to understand what the limitations are, what the advantages are, and how you might best use it in your scenario. And the last one here is, Cassandra is not relational. The, the biggest mistake I see with a lot of developers that are coming in to try and use Cassandra is they just try to use it like it's a relational database. Well, if you try to do that, you're pretty much guaranteed to fail. Uh, you, need, you, know, you need to spend some time, you need to understand it, you need to understand its limitations, and then figure out how you're going to apply, apply it. You can't just throw your relational database schema at it and expect to actually be able to accomplish anything from it. Um, so now if you're interested in learning some more, there's a couple of uh, links I have up here. Uh, specifically, if you're interested in learning more about Cassandra, I would highly recommend you go to the academy.datastacks.com link. Uh, that they actually provide a lot of very good free online training. You, you do have to register for it, but it, all the training is free. They have several uh, very very in-depth uh, courses on uh, not only Cassandra but the other aspects of the DataStack system, including Solar, Spark, and uh, actually they recently came out with one. They're they're going to be uh, DataStack is going to be releasing a graph engine on top of the their their version of Cassandra, uh, and they recently released a graph training on that as well. So uh, with that, I would, just, I would like to thank NDC Oslo for inviting me to come speak, and I'd like to thank all of you guys for coming and listening to me. Uh, and are there any questions? How do you do security between the replication? How do you do security between the, replica the nodes when replicated? Yeah. Uh, you can actually set up SSL okay. to, to secure the data between it, uh, you can and you can also secure the data and uh, write state as it's being written. Uh, to disk. You said you kind of filtering on the uh, partition key items. Yes. And you only talk about equality, but can you have some similar wild cards? So in your example, if I want to get out the data of, let's say, all the trucks of one manufacturer, is there any way to do that? No, there's not. Unfortunately, that's one of the limitations you have, is that partition key has to be equality comparisons. Uh, and, and the reason for that is because when uh, because those equality comparisons, if it needs to be equality comparisons so you can get the token out so it knows exactly where in the cluster to get it. That, that's one of the trade-offs you end up making in order to get that very fast read performance. The consistency level that you mentioned, uh, what, what is the impact if you have a nodes with a, uh, a network that is not that fast? Could that have a very negative impact? Absolutely. Because there's a lot of traffic. 
think I, I assume and yeah, if you have if you have nodes on a, on a network that's very slow, yeah, it, it will dramatically affect the performance overall. Over, overall in general. And then the consistency level is very yeah, the consistency level you can use to probably tune that to make it slightly better. You know, you may want to make it one instead of instead of quorum. But yeah, if you you pretty much have to have a very fast network between all your nodes internally in order to make it uh, very performant. What happens to that data? So if you so let's say for example you have the node is owned by node data or the data is owned by node one and node one is down. Well, that's where those two other replicas come into effect. If node one's down and it queries data that's owned by node one, th then the replicas from node two and node three will will service that request. Because we have a replication factor of three, yeah. Yeah, you're really what owning it means is it's the first of the nodes um, to, to, to have that data. How would Cassandra compare to DynamoDB? Is it roughly the same thing, or would you recommend one over the other? Uh, uh, so Cassandra, the actual uh, distributed model is, is inspired by DynamoDB, so that aspect of it is different. So uh, it, Cassandra, the, the, it was originally built at Facebook. It was inspired by... Uh, the, the distributed design was inspired by DynamoDB. The, the data model was inspired by Google Bigtable. As far as recommending it, I, you need to know more about the problem <laughs> before I could say one versus the other. But uh, they're very similar in a lot of ways. It's just like DynamoDB, I can get as a hosted service, and I don't need to care about the setup. Is this, what about Cassandra? As far as I know, there is no one that provides a hosted service. However, there, uh, you can spin up uh, AMIs in AWS, and actually Windows Azure has, has built-in support now for, as of, I think it was like November, they signed uh, an agreement with Microsoft to have uh, built-in support for, uh, for uh, Cassandra. Oh, sorry, actually it's not Cassandra, it's data stack specific. Sorry. <laughs> A classic geotime series like, database? Like uh, or um, Probably the biggest, the biggest would be the scalability aspect of it. Um, you know, if you start putting in, uh, you know, 2.2 gigabytes a day, it's going to not take that long in order to overwhelm many databases. <laughs> so. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, I, I, are you talking gRPC or are you talking yeah. the connecting to the cl the cluster? Because the, the the round robining in the driver was done in the cl was done in the Apache, uh, the Cassandra cluster, whereas gRPC you specify the specific address that you're that you're connecting to. But then they are, then they are changing, no. No. Oh. gRPC is it, it, it's run as a, it's run just like any other web service. There's a one endpoint. Uh, the round robining I think you're talking about was inside the. the exactly. Yeah. You know, Oh, yes, that is not, uh, this isn't gRPC. This is actually connecting to the Cassandra cluster. This is the Cassandra driver. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah. So it is actually a uh, binary that runs its own server inside of it. If you want to, uh, the way I've always done it when I've done it in Windows is just built a Windows service around it to run it. Uh, what I showed here is actually just a console app. Uh, if you want, I can show you how it actually. Uh, that's, that's enough for an answer. So, so, okay. so basically, you more or less also generate the server part with code generation, you, you, base package, I guess. That, that the, there is a few base packages you have to add around, there's like gRPC core, gRPC.native.c-sharp, they're all NuGet pack, NuGetable packages. Uh, and then what the, what's generated from the model definition is actually an interface that you have to implement. And for an app which would really, could, I mean, it's, I guess it's the same question, it's, it's just the same for an app that really has a large data intake, so you can probably not go with just one deep RPC app. 
No, you probably wouldn't. If you had, in this case, you probably would actually have to build a couple of gRPC endpoints, and then you could put whatever load balancing in front of it that you wanted to. All right. Well, if there's no more questions, I thank you. And if there's any other questions, I'll be around here uh, if anybody has anything else. Thanks. <laughs>